everybody, it's Tom, and I'm coming to you today to discuss Roland de Barthes, B-A-R-T-H-E-S, his uh, Pleasure of the Text, a seminal work, which kind of occupies a sort of transitional place within uh, the movement from structuralism to post-structuralism. Uh, we can almost bracket that consideration, though, as it would involve us in a recapitulation of um, developments within literature and literary theory that, uh, while significant, aren't uh, immediately germane to the uh, more general conclusions that can be elicited from this work, uh, The Pleasure of the Text. The you know, distinction which he um, applies here to Roland Barth, um, which is often cited in conversation around uh, the work, is between what is often called a readerly text as opposed to writerly text. Or sometimes that's put in terms of a text of pleasure as opposed to a text of bliss. In the background of these distinctions there are, you know, non-trivial uh, translation points, movementing movements from French into English. In the French, you know, there is a kind of subtler sense of the distinction between pleasure and bliss, with the latter often being connected to um, sexually uh, Involved pleasure orgasms, the orgasmic, as it were. But unlike in English, um, the consideration of that kind of encounter isn't uh, immediately saddled with a pejorative uh, connotation. Uh, that's a function of some cultural differences. Um, and um, we just want to be aware of that as we proceed through our discussion. Um, but as I said a few moments ago, the key distinction is between a readerly text or a text of pleasure and a writerly text or a text of bliss is a sometimes term. Now what's going on there? Well, what is going on is that with what we mean by a readerly text is a work, a book, most obviously an essay, though you can actually reconfigure the notion of text to extend beyond um, our ordinary understanding of uh, reading. Uh, just sort of a semi uh, an, an ensemble of uh, symbols as a work, and any kind of symbol can work as a kind of text. But um, with the readerly text, you have a use of style, which is sort of comfortable, and which allows the reader to just almost passively ingest the text as a corroboration of the sorts of presuppositions that the reader is bringing to bear upon it. Uh, in particular, the presuppositions which they are carrying over from uh, the cultural space, you know, in which they are primarily involved. So it's something which can allow a person to relax and to have a certain sort of surety that has a sort of pleasure to it. Kind of tantamount to the pleasure one might encounter in doing a crossword puzzle, for example, but not a particularly difficult <laughs> crossword puzzle. Um, by contrast, the text of Bliss actually is initially discomforting disconcerting, puts us out of step with those aforementioned presuppositions. And generally it's going to do this by using an alternative style or set of styles that uh, invoke language in a way that um, puts us out of our ordinary game, if you'll permit uh, kind of a tip of the hat to Wittgenstein there. You know, so you can look at somebody like and these are parade examples, common examples like James Joyce, or William Faulkner. They're very writerly texts. Now, why do we say writerly texts? Because 
the uh, discomfort which the encounter with these works produces compels the person who is interrogating the text to become involved in the creation of the world that they are referencing to in a way themselves become the very writer of the text and so you have a kind of overlap of the subjectivity of the writer and the reader and um, obviously well, I think it's pretty straightforward that Bart is exhorting us to really put the weight of our consideration in texts of bliss. And he says bliss because once you move past that initial discomfort, that jarring quality, and sometimes even, strangely enough, boredom, you can enter into an emancipatory space where you are no longer... Um, constrained or strictured by those presuppositions that you uh, had when you first uh, opened the book, proverbially speaking. And oftentimes those presuppositions may not even have been held consciously. In fact, you may not even be able to at first blush discern what specific axioms are being challenged by the uh, encounter being uh, put forth by whatever it is that you are encountering, whether that's an essay, a work of art, a piece of music. See, all these things are in a way textual. Um, now what's interesting, a few interesting thoughts here, is that this distinction, uh, this kind of approach doesn't necessarily inhere in the actual text may in fact, by contrast, reflect the attitude that you, as a reader, are bringing to the text. So you can take something, potentially, uh, that's very readerly, and you can approach it in a manner which is ultimately writerly. Uh, in, in this regard, what you're looking at is a choice uh, that is Externally originated rather than externally provoked. Now, whether that dovetails strictly with Barth's intent is a decidedly um, a point of some contention or controversy. But I think it's something that is uh, sort of amusing to consider. Uh, the other thing that happens here is uh, that. What Barth effectively, effectively does through this uh, framework and this tension between readerly and writerly texts and how different styles can disconcert us is he actually opens the door to um, a sort of more radical discussion about valuation and standards of uh, normativity, of normality, of you know, even the moral rigor as we uh, like to think. Um, because when one enters uh, into, you know, some challenging work, almost without realizing it, you end up placing in abeyance the uh, very standards that in your, you know, ordinary... Um, natural attitude, if you like, <laughs> um, are, are almost uh, presumed uh, as um, incontestable. And even things as obvious as the law of non-contradiction can be set aside so that when um, you are in the process of the textual engagement in reading uh, all of a sudden you find yourself in a space, a subjective space, which uh, perhaps is even in absolute antithesis to your ordinary self-conception. You can take, you know, any novel to see how this um, occurs. So, you, know, you can take something like um, The Brothers Karamazov, uh, where, you know, for, if you just look at the, 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 the different brothers of the text, Ivan, Dmitri, 
Alyosha, very remarkably different individuals. And then the fourth brother, whose name eludes me, I'm sorry, I uh, can't remember, but the, despite the fact there, there's an airplane going by there, I think. Um, despite the fact that these are radically different personalities at different points through the brothers Karamazov, you enter into each of these personalities in a way of identification. And all in all, as a result, the enormous um, malleability, plasticity of the human encounter is something that becomes not just theoretical, but viscerally palpable. And this is part of what is exciting about provocative writerly texts is that they give us a means whereby to expand the horizons of our vision. This also ultimately translates into broader social and political uh, considerations. Um, and, the, and there's different avenues that you can take uh, as far as to what those implications are. So much then, by way of some reflections on this very fine but brief work by uh, Roland Barth, The Pleasure of the Text. Uh, it's um, Again, it's pretty brief. Um, this translation upon which I relied was about 67 pages, I think, something in that neighborhood. And uh, you can download the PDF, and I will put the PDF, and I'll put those links below. This translation was by Richard Miller. So, all right, guys. Well, thank you for listening, as always. And uh, I will talk to you guys soon. Ciao.